Oh, CJ, you're too kind, but you actually you made my day because you said the Italy trip was a, a youth-focused trip, and then you defined youth, 14 and older. I'm going, yes, yes, yes. I'm there with multiples, so I'm very youthful. <clears throat> anyway, God is moving, isn't he? Amazing worship service today, just incredible. God's showing up. He's showing up sovereignly. He's moving by the power of his Holy Spirit. Let's let him move in our hearts today. Lord, we invite you to come this morning and speak to our hearts. Holy Spirit, have your way. Do everything that you intend in each of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 You know, as we do life, we, you know, we gather on Sundays and we get edified. But, but, you know, we live a lot of life, actually most of it, Monday through Saturday. You know, and, and a lot of that endeavor is focused on, you know, seeking some kind of blessing, wanting to be happy, right? We want to be blessed and happy. Who wants to be blessed and happy? Yeah, I mean, don't we all? Don't we all, right? I want to be blessed and happy. <clears throat> we have a problem, though. Our culture doesn't really teach us how to be truly blessed and happy. You've probably heard about the statistics about the loneliness epidemic that we're experiencing in our culture. So look at this. This is uh, from a CBS deal. Well, actually, it's not. It, it, in the CBS presentation, it said 46% of Americans sometimes or always feel alone. We're in one sense the most connected culture of all time. And yet we are possibly the most disconnected culture of all time. People hunger for relationship. We all do. We want to be fully known, fully loved, and that can only happen in the context of relationship. It makes complete sense when you think about it. We're created in the image of a relational God. You know, God in the triune uh, Trinity, the, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, they, they were happy. They were content. Honoring and glorifying and loving one another, however that whole mystery of the Trinity works. And yet they were so full of this love and this relating in love that, that then God created man in order to pour out that love. And we're created by a relational God for relationship. It's incredible that through man-made technology, we're led to believe that we're going to be connected and that we're going to have friends. <laughs> Yet it leaves people feeling disconnected and like they don't have any friends. Dr. Vivek Murthy, probably said that wrong, Surgeon General of the United States released an advisory in May calling attention to the public health crisis of loneliness, isolation, and lack of connection in our country. He recently wrote, loneliness and weak social connections are associated with a reduction in lifespan similar to that caused by smoking 15 cigarettes a day. The neediness in our culture is palpable. It's, it's, just, it's just there. It's raw. I'm so glad that we have a creator God who loves us and who gave us his word, who gave us some instructions for our life to guide us and to help us and didn't just give us his word, but he gave us himself. Not only to meet our needs, but just to be with us every moment of every day. He's a relational God. Let's stand together and read the scripture for today's message. This is a key verse for today. Matthew 5, 6 says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. You may be seated. <laughs> <clears throat> I 
So this scripture is, I just plucked it out of the middle of the song we sang today, right? <laughs> I plucked it out of the middle of what is called the Beatitudes. The word Beatitude, it comes from the Latin bea, <clears throat> Beatudo. Everybody say that. Beatudo. See, you know Latin now. There you go. Do you know what it means, though? Beatudo. Any of you have a guess what it means? It, was in, it means blessed. Yeah. Who, who said that? You know, La oh, Carol, of course. She's <laughs> Curtis married a smart woman. Yes. It means blessed. Blessedness. This is the fourth beatitude out of eight. The beatitudes were given by Jesus as the introduction to a sermon. So he was giving a sermon. He was a rabbi. He had followers. This was a ragtag group. This was a lot of probably, it was a rough crowd. These were people that knew they had a need. And we learned that even in the Beatitudes themselves. But he's very tuned in to his crowd, and he's giving the sermon. And this is the introduction to his sermon. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. What it really is is a discourse on discipleship. He's actually training his disciples on how to be disciples. <clears throat> and so when we go to Israel... We actually go and visit this place called the Mount of Beatitudes where this sermon possibly took place. Here's a picture. Oh, look at that. There I am standing. I didn't do my warrior pose there. But anyway, I, we're overlooking the Sea of Galilee. You know, this is like just up from Capernaum near Bethsaida and Chorazin. We read that in the Bible, about those places in the Bible. This is where Jesus set up his international evangelical headquarters right here in this gorgeous setting, Right? I mean, he's God, right? He can choose what he wants. And so he had a lake view. It was awesome. So he's teaching, he's teaching them. I think they were facing him, though, as he was looking at the water. Otherwise, they might have been distracted. But whatever. Uh, beautiful view. Beautiful setting. And uh, we love going there. Now, but on our church, this isn't just known as the Mount of Beatitudes. This is also known as the Mount of Engagement for CJ and Jenny Carrier. Right, right. So here we have some pictures, right? Look at this. It's a Mount of Engagement for CJ and Jenny here on the Mount of Beatitudes or the Mount of Engagement. I'm sure there's going to be people, many people in the years to come to, to go and visit this place, this Mount of Engagement, right, for that purpose, just to visit where CJ and Jenny got engaged. It was a great moment. I was there. Loved it. <laughs> we revisit the memory every time we go. Anyway, all right. But that, he's teaching these, these lessons. There's, uh, he's given the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is the Beatitudes. Let's look at this chart. I'm going to do a, just give you a chart to kind of quickly give the context for our scripture today. Notice that the first and the last Beatitude here have the same phrase. It says, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. At the top, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then the number eight says, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So what we have here in the Beatitudes is a kingdom of heaven sandwich. We got kingdom of heaven slice, kingdom of heaven slice, with a lot of instruction in between and a lot of guidelines in between about how we can be blessed. This is a blessed sandwich. I'm hungry for that, right? Who wants, this is, a, this is like, this has like, this is a thick one. This has a lot in there. But the context is the kingdom of heaven. You know, we're, we're told to pray, thy kingdom come. We sang about it today, right? Seek first the kingdom. This is a big deal. I want us to get even just further insight on how big a deal that is this morning. It's not an accident that Jesus sandwiched his sermon on the Beatitudes here in this way. What he did in this kingdom of heaven sandwich is convey to us the qualities of the citizens of his kingdom. Did you know that as a follower of Jesus, that you're actually a citizen of heaven? And that this world isn't your ultimate home. You might have a visa to be here for a while, but you're passing through. This is not our home, and we always have to constantly remind ourselves of that. We're surrounded by a lot of very temporal things. But there's some things in this life right now that are going to last forever. Those are the important things. That's what we're talking about today. The Beatitudes are like a pocket guide for life in the kingdom of heaven. 
You know, it's just like a little pocket guide for life in the kingdom. If you want to just know what life in the kingdom is like and have some guidelines for yourself on how to be blessed, you know, pocket those, the Beatitudes. I love this quote from C.S. Lewis. He says, if I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. And that is so true, isn't it? We were made for another world. Just remember that. When this life and circumstances of this life disappoint, you weren't made for this. We were made for Jesus and for the kingdom of heaven. We're citizens of that kingdom now and forever. Notice that the fourth and the eighth beatitude both mention the word righteousness. It says in, in four, our, our scripture for today in uh, Matthew 5, 6 says, Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, uh, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. And then eight says, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Okay, so righteousness is referred to in number four and number eight. So let's look at this then. The first, you could say that the first three Beatitudes help us recognize our need for and our dependence on God. So we have poor in spirit, poverty in spirit, probably poverty in real life. We have people that are mourning. They're mourning probably for a lot of things. Probably for a lot of it's probably for the the destruction in their life as a result of their sinful choices. They're probably grieving over a lot of losses and difficulty and and just how rough life is. And then you have the meek or the gentle or, or sometimes those that can be taken advantage of. Okay? And so these people are feeling the need. They're feeling needy. So you could say the, the first three of these Beatitudes help us recognize our need for and, our, and, our, and help us understand how dependent we are on God, which then causes us to hunger and to thirst, right, for righteousness. So that's number four. So we're now we're hungering and we're thirsting for righteousness. Then the next three are fruits of living out that righteousness. You'll notice. You'll notice, so I'll just, I'll get to it in a minute. I, gotta, I can't get ahead of myself. So the first three are not characteristics of an overflowing fullness, right? They're beautiful and they're good in their place, but they are not yet the richness and the fullness and the overflowing goodness that we long for. After hunger and satisfaction in verse 6 comes, you, have, you then have blessed are the merciful in verse 7. Now, the blessed person is full, and he's overflowing in mercy. He is not merely broken and sorrowful and meek. He is now active and overflowing with deeds of mercy toward others. He can see others. He's not just focused on his neediness. He can now see the needs in others and meet that with mercy. Verse 8 says that he is pure in heart. That means he's right with God. He has good character and virtue and integrity. And he's pure in heart before God. So his relationship with God is right. And and he's doing well there. And then verse 9 says that he's not just peaceful, but he's a peacemaker. You ever been a peacemaker? Usually if you're a peacemaker, that means you rolled up your sleeves and got involved in a messy situation that needed some peacemaking. Seriously. I mean, you can be a peacemaker that, that helps proactively prevent Conflict and messes and quarrelsomeness. But you can also be a peacemaker that's willing to get involved and to be helpful and bring reconciliation. Okay, so then this second group of these four Beatitudes ends with, like I mentioned, another reference to righteousness. Only this time it's not a hunger for righteousness which is lacking, but it's a persecution for righteousness with which we are overflowing. And we now are looking like and acting like Jesus himself. And as a result, being persecuted for it. Because it's so otherworldly. It's so counterculture that our culture doesn't necessarily get get it. And they're not necessarily seeking righteousness either, right? They're not seeking these qualities of of being a disciple of Jesus. So they're not going to understand. So we have to expect them not to understand. And we'll probably be persecuted. And what does it say here? Blessed are you who are persecuted. Happy are you who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. So that's how we're to process process that. 
So now they're looking like and acting like Jesus. So he's our standard. Matthew 5.48 says this. Be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Wow, pretty high standard. (laughs) He never compromises the standard. But with grace, he meets us where we're at and helps us to continue on. We are to imitate Christ. And notice this. Notice that Jesus only did what he saw the Father doing. He was imitating God. He was following God. So we imitate him. He's imitating God. So, so who else imitates in life? Children. We're directed to be childlike in large part because children are really good at imitating. They really are. They're like a blank slate. And then they, they, they then just start imitating those that they're around. I love it. And some of you are going to be surprised at this, but I just so happen to have a video and a couple of pictures of my grandchildren imitating their parents. So here's a video of Pippa. <laughs> if you didn't hear the first part, she, uh, Bryn went, and then Pippa just did it. Look at this. So I come over to the house the other day to Jacob Val's place, and, and Phoebe's there, greets me with an apron, and she's cooking in her kitchen. Now, her dad and her mom, they both love to cook. Phoebe just is surrounded by a lot of cooking in this house, and now she has her own, own uh, set of cookware and knives and a charcuterie board there she was creating for me. You know, I, she greets me at the door. She goes, Grandpa, come in. Come and sit down. And then I come in. I sit down. She's cutting the carrot, and I reach to grab it. She goes, oh, no, not yet. Not yet. <laughs> and she, she wants to get it all displayed, and then I have to go sit in a special place and then eat it. And it was this whole process, and I just love it. But she's imitating what she sees. She's imitating what she sees. You know, are we looking at Jesus? Are we looking at his word? So that what's in our view, what's in our focus, what we see is him and how he does things. And then we're doing that. That's what Jesus is doing here in the Beatitudes. So the title of my message today, that was all introduction. The title of my message today is how to be happy, healthy, and whole. How, you know, three H's. How to be happy, healthy, and whole. <laughs> School wasn't very good when I went, but anyway. (laughs) They were going to ask me to teach English, but they just uh, decided not to. Okay, so how to be happy, healthy, whole. First point, how to be happy. The word blessed in in these Beatitudes means supremely blessed. Supremely blessed, fortunate, well off, and happy. Means happy. Now, it's a high quality happy, not just a circumstantial fleeting happy. It's a deep and a high quality happy, but it nonetheless is happy. It's not just joy, it actually translated happy. I'm named after my grandpa, Carl North. My middle name's Carl. Jesse's middle name's Carl, and uh, his nickname was Happy. That's what they called him, Carl Happy North. They called him Hap. Hey, Hap. I thought that was a cool nickname. Probably why I like uh, the idea of grand being a grandpa. <laughs> My grandpa taught me a lot. Um, but <clears throat> when Jesus came, he said that he came to give us peace, right? I know I'm using another word here. But he came to give us peace. It's the Greek word, arene. But he, when Jesus is saying this, what people are hearing is, this, is the idea of shalom, this Hebrew word of shalom, because it was ingrained in Jewish culture. So the hearing, he came to give us shalom, and not as the world gives it, he says, though, but as he gives it. There's a distinction. And the word shalom, we've heard it in messages recently, and we know that it means Broken pieces that are made whole. It also means well-being. Just that sense of being well. And it means peace. So in the same way that he's telling us here how we can be happy, it's not 
in the way the world tells us to be happy, right? Another way to say it is that the Beatitudes are a description of the good life, the abundant life. That's what I mean by the good life, not the good life just on earth, but the good life of the kingdom, the abundant life that Jesus invites us into and that God promises. All right, so second point, moving quickly. Spend most of our time here on second point. Uh, So here we go. To be healthy. To be healthy in our spirit, soul, and body, we need to watch what we eat. No other way around it. We need to watch what we eat. We need to train ourselves to hunger and thirst for the right things. It's critical. I find myself constantly trying to learn what is healthy for my spirit, my soul, and my body. And then I try to adjust. And then I try to train my appetites and my hungering and my thirsting to line up with that which is healthy. We need to be extremely intentional about this process, and it's a constant process for our spirit, our soul, and our body. We need to be eating nutritious meals in every aspect of our life. Another analogy in the scripture is this idea of abiding in the vine, right? Abiding in Jesus, abiding in the vine. We're the branch, he's the vine. So as a branch is attached to a vine, it hungers and it thirsts for what the vine offers. And it knows that's the source, and it stays attached. It's not going to go anywhere else. As soon as that vine, that branch is disconnected from the vine, it dies. As soon as it attaches to another source that it's not intended to be fed by, it dies. It only lives when it's attached to the vine that it was created to be attached to. I believe that our hunger and our thirst are the attachment point to God who is our source of righteousness. So if we want to have this happy life that hungers and thirsts for righteousness, this blessed life, we must stay, stay attached to him. He's our source. He's the source of all we need. Hungering and thirsting for righteousness in many ways is hungering and thirsting for the presence of God himself, right? We don't want to lose it. We don't want to compromise it. I love the messages Pastor Phil's been bringing on the presence of God. Are you hungry for his presence? Are you hungry? Psalm 42, great psalm expressing this. It says, as a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? You're going to sense the psalmist's desire to be in the presence of God. To hunger means to famish, to crave, to be needy, to seek with eager desire. (laughs) I remember growing up, I would, uh, on a Saturday, often wake up to the smell of cooking bacon. Now, when I say wake up, it may not have been the morning, just saying. But anyway, the smell of cooking bacon, and then there was like sauteing mushrooms, and then there was this beef being cooked, and then it was all, and there's some wine poured into it, and then, there, and then there's this, it just begins to, all these ingredients put together simmering, and my mom was making beef bourguignon, you know, or beef burgundy, a favorite in our family uh, story. And I would wake up, and I'd smell all these smells coming upstairs while I was in bed, and I'd just go, oh, this is going to be a good day. It's going to be a good, good day. And I'd just get hungry. I'd just get hungry, and I would would want to seek that with eager desire before it was ready even. But uh, anyway, I... uh, I, you know, it, 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 hunger, to hunger and thirst for the right things. Thirst means thirst. It means thirst. But look at this. It means those who painfully feel their want of those things by which the soul is refreshed, supported, and strengthened. Painfully feel. You know those pangs in our heart, those pangs in our life? that say there's more. I want more. I'm thirsting for something more. I want Jesus I want what he offers. Think the woman at the well, right? She was hungering and thirsting. She didn't even really know what she was hungering and thirsting for. She was seeking it in all the wrong places. And Jesus graciously 
meets her. Hunger and thirst are God-given appetites that can lead us in either a healthy or an unhealthy direction, right? What do you hunger and thirst for? What do you hunger and thirst? What sounds good to you right now? Beef, pork, and tea. <laughs> that was a good answer. <laughs> that was a good answer. You know, I will say, I didn't uh, have it in my notes, but uh, concerning that, uh, actually, God himself was the first French chef. So I'll just say it really quick. In Leviticus, I don't have the chapter and verse right now, but it does talk about God uh, directing the, the Levites and the Israelites to offer up this bullock. And they're barbecuing bullock. See why? You with me? Okay, bar- they're barbecuing. They're barbecuing this bullock, right? So they're this beef, basically. And so they're barbecuing. And then, and then God says that they, he commands them, directs them that to pour out a wine offering over it. Right? Sound familiar? Right? Okay. Wine offering. It's mixing with the bullock juices. Right? And then, then he says, take some flour mingled with oil. Probably olive oil. Healthy. This is healthy. Anyway, flour mingled with oil. It's called a roux. It's what you use to thicken sauces. So just pour that out over it. Oh, yeah. Now this beef and this wine mixture are thickening with his, bar, with his bullock that's cooking, and he's making bullock bourguignon, right? So God is the first French chef. I love that story because I love to cook. I came to WCU to take hospitality, and I, I, it was all because I love to cook. And so here we go. Uh, God himself is the originator of all that. You've probably heard me preach it before, but that's okay. Um, so I was talking to Dave Ratliff. Uh, in preparation for the message, actually. And he was telling me about what's called Nova classifications for food. And there's four classifications. Here they are. One is unprocessed or minimally processed foods. That'd be like an apple. And then you have processed culinary ingredients. That would actually be like a sliced apple, maybe with some uh, ascorbic acid, some preservative or something on it. Then you have processed foods. That'd be like applesauce. And four, you have ultra-processed foods. That would be like a McDonald's apple pie <laughs> that may or may not have apples in it. We, we really don't know. <laughs> they did a study and found that around 73% of the food in our grocery stores are in category four. 73%. Some call category four items food-like substances that are edible. It's not necessarily food. It's just food-like substances that are actually edible. But they're not healthy for us. 73% as you go to the store. Just be aware. And since that is what our culture and our society has produced in order to provide for us food for our bodies... I would venture to say that the percentages are similar or worse for what the culture offers us as food for our souls and our spirits. So who needs to be aware of what we're eating? All of us do. Our culture lies to us. It says, we'll connect you. We'll give you friends. Only to leave you lonely. It says, it says, eat these fruit snacks. Eat these fruit snacks. Mott's fruit snacks. I'm not picking on Mott's. I don't even know who makes them. But they're made with real fruit, <laughs> veggie juice. But you look at that. So much assorted fruit. Fruit snacks. Fruit is healthy, right? I want a snack. There's fruit. I want a healthy snack. I'm going to eat some fruit snacks. I'd like some assorted fruit. It's good to eat a lot, right? It's all good, right? It's all good. Fruit, snacks, healthy. First three ingredients on these fruit snacks, these healthy fruit snacks, is corn syrup, sugar, modified cornstarch. Anybody want some? <laughs> I just wanted to see who I needed to keep preaching to. So, yeah, it's a <laughs> <laughs> I 
just want to see if anybody out there needed the message or not. But <laughs> That's what our culture offers up. Artificial. Artificial things to feed our hungering and our thirsting. The good news is that Jesus says we're going to be blessed. We're going to be happy as we hunger and thirst for righteousness. So what is righteousness? I'm glad you asked. Righteousness means justification. It's the state of him who is as he ought to be. Righteous. The condition acceptable to God. Also made possible by God. (laughs) It's integrity. It's virtue. It's purity of life. It's rightness. And get this, it's correctness of thinking, feeling, and acting. Correctness of thinking, feeling, and acting. Sounds like mere class, doesn't it? Rational, volitional, and uh, emotional realm. All right. I think the best way to convey this is actually to go all the way back, though, to the Garden of Eden. All right? We're going to go back to the Garden of Eden, and then we're going to preach everything in between this and that. No, just easy. We're going to go all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Things were in a perfect and a righteous state, right? We know that. Things were created in perfection. There was perfect unity and harmony. There was beauty and love being shared between Adam and Eve and God and, and all of the above. And it was great. It was wonderful. But then Adam and Eve got hungry. They got hungry. They started thirsting. And they started hungering and thirsting for something they were told not to eat. For the wrong thing. Then they ate that fruit of the tree. I'm sure it was McDonald's apple pies on it. But But this thing they were commanded not to eat. But then they desired it. Hungered and thirsted for it. Sin entered the scene. Now Adam and Eve's relationship with God was corrupted, right? They sinned. It was corrupted. God confronts Adam. So when God confronts Adam, what does Adam do? Adam says, hey, it was Eve's fault. It was her fault. So now guess what? Things aren't good in Adam and Eve's relationship, right? There's a problem there, right? Problem in the marriage. So Adam is now blaming Eve. So guess what? Guess what that sin did? It didn't just corrupt the relationship with God. It corrupted Adam and Eve's relationship. You know, and then he confronts Eve, and, and Eve didn't want to take responsibility for it. It was the serpent's fault. So there's all this corruption going on in relationship, all these relationships going south because of what? Because of sin. So this original setting of righteousness in the Garden of Eden was corrupted by sin. And now we have unrighteousness. And this unrighteousness, how is it manifested? Through corrupted relationships that now need to be restored. So another way to define righteousness before God is to have right standing with God. And the same is true in our relationships with one another. Having a relationship that is righteous is one where there is right standing with one another. Sin has compromised both of these things. So when Jesus tells us to hunger and thirst for righteousness... In many ways, he's saying hunger and thirst to be in right relationship with God and with others. And this fits with the two great commandments, right? Love God and love your neighbor and one another. He's very consistent. Now, to to make this all practical and to illustrate this in real life, real time, I'd like to share about a day I had a couple weeks ago on February 8th. It was a rough day, circumstantially. But spiritually, by God's grace, it was a day of victory. So I'm going to share a victory. (laughs) But I had a struggle in the midst, and I had to strive, like we learned about in BF New today. I just tried to stay in the right place, but oh, it was so good. It was so good, and and I'm so grateful for Jesus for helping me stay there. But how how the day started was with some plumbers that showed up to help me solve a problem. I had a plumbing problem. It was a problem developed over probably tens of years, like probably 10, 20, 30 years. 
because there was a drain pipe that had come down that, that picked up drains from three apartments, came down into the ground, went horizontal, but at the end of it, before it went into the main line, there was a belly. A belly's not good in a plumbing pipe. You want it to flow smoothly all the way down. There was a belly. That meant that water stopped there, and it would push water back. So that means water's always sitting in that line. Guess what happened over 30, 40 years? The pipe rotted. So now we have a problem, right? And so plumbers come to help me solve that problem. So what they do is they jack up the concrete. We determine the plan. Jacked up the concrete. They're gonna, they pull out that pipe, and then they replace that pipe. And as they're jacking up the concrete, during that time, I get a text from a tenant saying, all my lights went out. Okay. So we're solving a problem. But then now we have a real problem. And so what happened is the jackhammer penetrated these conduit lines were right under the concrete. Fully penetrated and severed one of the lines going to a unit and severed another line going to another unit. It actually punctured four other lines. Didn't sever the electrical line there, but we had to repair those. So then I call an electrician to come help. And praise God, there's some amazing tradespeople. How many of you have worked in the trades before or work in the trades now? You're heroes. You, you solve problems. You, seriously, thank you for doing that. I've been helped by many of the tradespeople in this place. <laughs> and so this day I called a, an electrician, and, and they're a brother in the Lord. They come, they work hard, not able to get the electricity back on in those two units. I find that out kind of later in the day. But they worked hard, and then they were going to show up the next day on their day off. Friday they do four tens, but they're going to come Friday. They came Friday and worked all day. But that night, February 8th, that night, so I now have two units without electricity. And so I, I didn't know that till at the end of the day. I'd gone to an exercise class. I was talking on the phone, coming out of the exercise class, and I'm walking to my vehicle. And, and so I have the phone here. It's dark. I parked in a place that's, you know, pretty nondescript, and you can just back out and go. There's, it's like no parking behind you or anything. And so I, I didn't even look around. I get in my car. I back out and crunch. I back into another vehicle. And what I was hurrying about and so focused on is I was trying to take two extension cords down to my tenants who needed electricity. And so I was trying to get them some electricity. So right now I have four relationships that I need to navigate. I need to navigate the relationship with the plumber who, made, who did an accident. They didn't know there was conduit under there. They were just there to help me. Now, I kind of wanted it to be their problem. <laughs> Part of me did, I confess. Because two electricians for like a couple days, that can add up, plus all the parts, right? But it wasn't their problem. I need to own that. And so by God's grace, he helped me know that like right away, quicker than maybe <laughs> I would have gotten that in the past. And I was so grateful because they was able to graciously, with peace, relate to the plumbers. And graciously, with peace, relate to the electricians. And just be grateful that they were solving my problem, even though it's still not solved permanently. You know, we still have to be in, you know, there's other inspections, things that have to happen. And then he graciously allowed me. So the guy that parked behind me, guess what? He was parked in an illegal spot. There was no parking there. It was a curb cut. No parking. So he was parked illegally, but guess whose fault it is? It's my fault. So I needed to own that because anytime you're driving, you hit anything, it's your fault. So you got to be aware. You got to look, right? And so that's my fault. So now I'm, I'm able, in the midst of all of this, to relate to this person who I felt a little bit violated by, but in reality, it's my fault. So I needed to own that. So we came to some terms, and his, I looked at his vehicle uh, yes, Friday. It looks pretty good. We got it repaired, right? Washed and waxed his car for it, had it, you know, anyway. It was all good. Got to redemptively navigate that. Really. But then I have these tenants. I got to take care of them, right? So then you're working hard and navigating all that. And anyway, it, by God's grace, all of it is working out. But the thing that was on my heart, number one, largely due to B.F. New and studying the commands of Jesus, is I didn't want to violate my relationship with God. 
And I didn't want to violate my relationship with these people. Which meant that I had to own some things. And I had to let this be real in my life. And not just great concepts that we kind of get in our head, but things that we can actually live out. So in this story, the most important thing were the relationships. Managing right relationships through these trials was and is, I believe, what it means to hunger and thirst for righteousness and to stay on that path. So I'm learning that true righteousness grows in humility through patient acceptance of whatever life may throw at us, whether life brings us poverty or wealth, sickness or health, or just normal day-to-day existence. The deeper rewards of the Christian life come through patient and obedient dependence upon God as we navigate the challenges of everyday life. (laughs) Working on the Bible Foundation's new class, which is a class on the commands of Jesus, observing and obeying the commands of Jesus, it's incredible. It's rocked my world. In so many ways, I feel like I'm just beginning to live the kind of Christianity that Jesus makes possible for us. Now, I think we can feel that way throughout our life because sanctification is a process. It never ends. So I love this quote from the book, All That Jesus Commanded by John Piper. It says, the righteousness that exceeds the Pharisees' righteousness, which we're commanded to do. He, said, he, he was telling his followers, your righteousness needs to be better than the Pharisees who prided themselves on their righteousness. So theirs was external. He's talking about a righteousness from the heart. So he says this in the book, Piper says, the righteousness that exceeds the Pharisees' righteousness is the new heart that trusts Jesus and treasures him above money, praise, popularity, power, and sex, and everything else in the world. The treasures, trusts Jesus and treasures him above money, praise, and sex, and everything else in the world. Treasuring what is infinitely valuable is in one sense the easiest thing in the world. Truly. If you view something as infinitely valuable, if you view it that way, treasuring that, that's easy. The problem is, what do we view as infinitely valuable? So we need to put all the things of the kingdom in the infinitely valuable category. That becomes our guide for life. That becomes what we live by. That's our value. Those are the qualities that we yearn for, that we hunger and thirst for, and want to live, and don't want to lose. And guess what Jesus says? You're going to be miserable when you do that, right? No. He says you're going to be blessed. You're going to be happy. The reason we're not blessed and happy is because of the things that we view as infinitely valuable. So then he goes on in this quote, and this is really why I like it. (laughs) He says, treasuring what is infinitely valuable is, in one sense, the easiest thing in the world. Like being commanded to enjoy your favorite food. It would be like me being commanded, Tom, you're going to get up and you're going to enjoy that beef burgundy today. Oh, okay. (laughs) That sounds good. Love it. Bring it on. But that's essentially what he's doing. He's saying all these things are for you. All these beatitudes, they're all for you. These aren't miserable things. Circumstantially, they might be tough. That was a tough day on February 8th. I have a lot of tough days. But God's good. He's good. He continually is faithful and reveals himself and meets me in the midst of all this. And I may want to sell some rentals, so we'll just see. But anyway. Uh... So in the kingdom of God, what is infinitely valuable is relationship with God and relationship with each other and with others and with the world, right? That is what Adam and Eve lost when they sinned, right? They lost that right relationship. Hungering and thirsting for righteousness is hungering and thirsting for that which is infinitely valuable, which is, I would venture to say, 
a restoration of a Garden of Eden-like walk with God. An unhindered one that he invites us into now. It's hard to regularly eat nutritious, healthy food. It just plain is. It's hard. you got to work so hard at that. You have to be so intentional. And it's no different for our spirit and our soul. You have to be so intentional. What are you going to do to make sure you're eating nutritious, healthy spirit and soul food? Ooh, soul food. That sounds good. Anyway. (laughs) What we hunger and thirst for is what we pursue. Are you craving Jesus and his righteousness? <laughs> Matthew 6, we sang it today. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, it says. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added. Seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be added. Last point, really quick, is whole. The third age. What is the promise for those who hunger and thirst for righteousness? It says they shall be satisfied. Other translations say filled. Filled to the full. Satisfied and filled means to gorge. (laughs) I love it. To supply food in abundance. To fulfill or satisfy. It was like my 65th birthday when Jake made this feast for me. And it was all this healthy stuff that tasted great. Oh, it was awesome. I loved it. But I ate to the full, and I actually felt good. (laughs) The promise is that he's going to gorge us with his righteousness. And that's gorgeous. (laughs) He's going to gorge us with his righteousness, with his character, with his presence. He's not withholding. As we hunger and thirst for this righteousness, he's not holding back. This is an all-you-can-eat buffet for a lifetime funded by Jesus. Thank you, Lord. No wonder these people in Beatitudes are happy. They get all of that which is infinitely valuable, and it's going to be so satisfying. And when we partake and are filled with his righteousness, we're going to find that we've been made whole. We've been made whole. Jesus said he came to give us that peace that we talked about, but not as the world gives. His isn't circumstantial. His is that shalom we talked about, where those broken pieces are made whole. The broken pieces of our life, the broken pieces that started in the Garden of Eden because of Adam and Eve, everything got broken. And ever since then, God's been trying to restore that relationship with mankind. And that's why God himself and Jesus came to die for us, to reconcile us to him. And to take that broken relationship and to make it whole again. He paid everything for that. Fully funded by him. So that we can have wholeness with him, wholeness with one another. John 6, 35 says, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whosoever comes to me shall not hunger. And whoever believes in me shall never hunger thirst. Thank you, Jesus. In conclusion, I'm just going to read one more scripture. And it's Isaiah 55 that captures this whole thing. It's prophesied. So Jesus said this in John 6 that I just read. But in Isaiah 55, 1 through 3, it says, Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, it doesn't matter. Come anyway. You don't need any money to buy and eat of what I'm offering. He who has no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. It's free. These are free gifts. Why do you spend money for that which is not bread and labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Real food, category one food, whole food that will make you whole. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear that your soul may live. That's what the Holy Spirit wants to speak to us today. 
He says, come and drink. Drink of the water that will satiate your thirst. Come and eat of him. And he will satisfy you. God bless you. Thank you.